Today on Listen Up, strangers in our midst. With immigration levels at historic highs, how is Canada treating its newcomers? That's next. Welcome to Listen Up, I'm Lorna Duick. Immigrants, they leave home and often family, and all that's familiar to start over in a new land. Canada has been built on them and it still is. 20 years from now, it's projected that one quarter of all people in this country will be foreign born. More than three quarters will have a mother tongue that is neither English nor French. And some will come as refugees fleeing persecution, others in search of a better life. But what will they find when they get here? Today we're exploring Canada's challenge to welcome immigrants and refugees from the perspective of our Christian faith. Recent data from Statistics Canada shows that Canada's population growth is the highest among the GA countries, due overwhelmingly to international migration. Our government expects these historically high rates to continue, and as Canada revises legislation to manage the influx, one of the greatest areas of change has been in how we deal with refugees. Ricky Ratliff met up with Canada's Minister of Citizen and Immigration, Jason Kenney. We're welcoming people with, with the highest relative level of immigration in the developed world, year after year. This is an, an experiment that has never been tried. Looking to build on this experiment, the government is bracing for an influx of new refugees. Those are people typically living in UN refugee camps, victims of warfare, conflict, and these are people that can't get a, an airplane ticket, they can't come to Canada, they, they can't get a visa, they're stuck. They're stuck in refugee camps. They're stuck in terrible, in urban slums, in, in really, really, and sometimes for 10 or 15, 20 years. Minister Kinney believes they'll find vacancy at Hotel Canada, opening its doors from 12,000 resettled refugees to 14,500. But the doors aren't open to everyone as Minister Kinney moves to fix an asylum system he believes has gone awry. 60,000 claim cases currently sit in backlog. So what we would do under the streamlined balance system that I proposed is to remove those false refugee claimants a year after they've lost an appeal. We would give faster protection to bona fide refugees, but we would also remove the false refugee claimants who are abusing Canada's generosity much more quickly. Is this just about efficiency and economics? No, it's about, uh, it's about humanitarian, it's about reinforcing our humanitarian instinct as a country. Um, and, and so this is where you start to rely on the private organizations that's and churches. That's right. Two, why them? I think it's the long tradition of practical charity in the Christian mm -hmm. community, and it's because the, the churches are pretty well organized. I hope that, you know, as we see growing religious diversity in Canada, that other faith communities will follow the Christian's example by, by collaborating with my ministry to help it to help basically save more victims of warfare, ethnic cleansing, persecution and torture in having a new beginning here in Canada. Some argue relying on the church's generosity to sponsor refugee increases is asking and assuming a lot. Under the new plan, 2,000 of the additional refugees must be sponsored by a private organization to provide financial and social support. The Refugee Lawyers Association of Ontario is also taking issue with the reforms seven to be exact. Issue number one, how the government defines a safe country of origin. It's a list that of, of countries which are the source of a large number of refugee claims that are overwhelmingly determined to be unfounded, not legitimate claims. Minister Kinney cites examples of abuse to the system from democratic countries like Portugal, Chile and Hungary. This refugee couple just obtained legal status in Canada. From a so-called safe country, their reasons for fleeing were anything but safe. Still fearing for their family's safety back home, we shadowed their faces for protection. We were really in fear for, for our safety, so we decided, we, one day we realized that we couldn't live in Uruguay anymore. And in a case with Uruguay, basically it's a democratic state, and so there was some concern that because they're coming from a country where they are to protect, um, will they be able to access that protection from Canada? And although his English falters, he doesn't waver in his concerns Try for changes to the system. To put changes the that could have cost him his life. But sometimes you, you, you can't say this country is safe or the other one. No, you, you don't know the country. 
the minister do doesn't know my country. Speeding up the process for claimants to receive a hearing from nearly two years to two months sounds good on paper. But those who know the system firsthand find that aspect worrisome. I think it's the speed. I think in the case that we're discussing here, it took several months to get medical reports, and uh, the bane of my existence is chasing things down internationally that I know are credible. I know that I've done my due diligence. I know they're legitimate documentation because I put my name behind those documents as well. It's and if you have to be ready to, in eight days, go to tell your story, I mean, this is, you're in shock. I don't know if you will be able to get things processed um, fairly, like when you have a person that is, is in that situation. A lot of them end up in shelters. A lot of them are too scared to talk for several months to even reveal what really happened to them. So Since arriving in Canada, this couple has worked full time to provide for their daughter. They've refused the government assistance available to every refugee claimant. I, I work like everybody else. No, nobody give me money. I don't, I don't ask the government for nothing. What will be the consequences if Parliament doesn't get this right? I think the consequences are, first and foremost, you're going to send someone back um, to horrible torture or death. Our product in this industry are humans. And uh, what is the margin of error here? One, two, how many people do you want to be sent back that end up being tortured or killed? Although he does credit the minister for addressing the cracks in the system, this son of immigrants still hopes to protect Canada's hospitable reputation. I think we need to continue to be seen as a country of invitation, a country of safety, a country of welcoming many, but on the flip side, not a country that will necessarily um, accept fraudulent claims or be one where our systems can be exploited. He's one of the Canadian Bar Association's 37,000 lawyers wrestling with those challenges as they take the government to task. In the case of refugee claimants versus Canada, there simply is no room for trial and error. For Listen Up TV, I'm Ricky Ratliff. When Listen Up returns, when refugees come to Canada, where do they go? Opening doors of possibility for Canada's claimants. Next. <laughs>